Hi, Dr. Regan Robertson, CCO of Productive Dentist Academy here, and I have a question for you. Are you finding it hard to get your team aligned to your vision, but you know you deserve growth just like everybody else? That's why we've created the PDA Productivity Workshop. For nearly 20 years, PDA workshops have helped dentists just like you align their teams, get control of scheduling, and create productive practices that they love walking into every day. Just imagine how you will feel when you know your schedule is productive, your systems are humming, and your team is aligned to your vision. It's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. We can help. Visit ProductiveDentist.com slash workshop. That's ProductiveDentist.com slash workshop to secure your seats now. Sometimes doctors will ask, hey, what are my rights? And I do X, Y, or Z. And the answer typically would lie in their actual legal contract. That is what typically governs. And so the normal attorney response that everyone hates is, quote, unquote, it depends. Welcome to Investment Grade Practices Podcast, where we believe private practice dentists deserve to get the lifestyle today while building an asset for tomorrow. Join your host, Victoria Peterson, to design the practice of your dreams and secure your financial independence. Let's get started. Well, I will be recording this and transcribing it for the new book, Investment Grade Practices, and I'm so thrilled that you are willing to support this. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be part of it and honored to be a part of it. I'm really looking forward to it. That's great. Do you mind if I just jump right in? Let's do it. Okay. So the format of the book has three sections. The first is invest in yourself. So doctors investing in their leadership and business acumen skills. And the second is grow your asset. And then the third section is protecting your asset. I think that you, you probably could speak to all three. (laughs) Um, Right, right. In this first section, though, on investing in your legal education, I'm wondering if you can give some thought to, gosh, you did such experience, right? Of what are, what are some of the basic things that every business owner should know about contract law? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. I think even before getting to contract law and what they should know about it, I'll, it's really important as a part of investing in one's um, self and they that they connect with a teammate that is an attorney that specializes in helping dentists with their business legal matters and the practices. And I say that because the dental world is unique and there are factors that need to be considered that are special or, you know, I guess I would say um, that are specialized towards the dental realm that are just different than in the normal business law realm. So I think that that's really critical component. But as far as what a contract, what a, what a doctor should understand about a contract is that every contract has three elements. There is an offer, there's an acceptance, and there's consideration. So an offer is pretty self-explanatory. That's when an offer is made, you know, hey, marketing company, we're offering to hire you um, exchange for blank services that um, you'd be providing. And then once that offer is accepted, then you'd have the offer and acceptance and the consideration would be the money that's being paid to that marketing company in exchange for those services that are being provided to the practice. And I think it's just important that every dentist knows from a foundational level really what a contract means and what it is. And in that contract, that is typically what is going to govern the relationship. Now, yes, there are some laws, and always specific to states that a doctor is in, that may trump what's in a contract, but... For the most part, the contract is going to govern. And a lot of times, default laws with respect to contracts 
come into play only when the contract does not speak on that item. And then I think the final thing that I would say is, so I guess in other words, just to kind of expand a little bit on that, sometimes doctors will ask, hey, what are my rights? Can I do X, Y, or Z? And the answer typically would lie in their actual legal contract. That is what typically governs. And so the normal attorney response that everyone hates is, quote, unquote, it depends. Well, <laughs> an attorney will typically say it depends um, based on what their contract actually says. Um, so I think that that's really important for the doctor to know. And then I think also what's important for uh, the doctor to know from a sort of like a fundamental level about the contract is that if there's any ambiguity in a contract or vagueness or something that the contract does not please really speak on, what a court would typically do is look to the intention of the party. So if the contract is big something that the parties have a disagreement on, usually it would be, if, you know, obviously if it got to a point of getting to a court, which typically it doesn't, but if it does, they're going to look at the intent of the parties, and so they'll look at outside communication typically, or emails, or oral, oral etc., try to determine really what was the intent of the parties when they went into this, and that's how they'll formulate their answer. So despite the fact that most contracts they get settled prior, or they get agreed to prior, it's important to understand what the final outcome is based on and try to understand the legal positioning that the client has. So I, I would say that what I just mentioned would be sort of fundamental of contract law that these doctors should be aware of. And that is so rich. Um, Let me know if I'm speaking too fast, too. Sorry. <laughs> This is going great. One of the things that you've helped me understand over the years is that um, relationships are easy to get into. It's easy to buy a dental practice. It's easy to form a partnership. All of that's easy. Getting out of it is a part that can be tough. So you, you've really focused my business mind on being very pragmatic about writing into the contract. How could this be? How could I unwind it? You know, what happens in the event that either party decides, like, that's no longer the path I want to go down? Do you have any advice on how to protect yourself or what to look for as you're setting up the relationship? I, I do. I think that um, the first thing that I'll say is that in my personal opinion, and this isn't what the law says, so it's a little bit contrary to what I just talked about when I defined what contracts really are to the doctor. But in my personal opinion, there's really three phases of a deal. There's how you get into the deal, how you operate through the deal, and how you get out of the deal. So in terms of trying to be pragmatic, I really try to break things down very simply and straightforward for the doctor. So there's getting in, operating through, and there's getting out. Getting into the contract is the negotiation of the deal. Operating through the contract is really governed by the language of the contract in terms of how things will operate as you go along in the relationship. And then getting out of the deal should be governed as well in that contract to, to provide for an exit strategy for the parties if things don't work out, or even if things do work out, but the task has been satisfied and the parties are moving on. So I think that it's important to make sure that not only are these three phases covered, but that they're covered thoroughly enough so that, you know, the doctor can kind of proceed forward on a preventative, proactive basis and not have any surprises later on. So I think what normally doctors should be looking for, to answer your question more specifically, in operating through the deal, is well, what are the terms under which the contract is going to be governed by? And that's something that has to probably stay vague for the purpose conversation because there's so many different things a contract can be about. But in the, in the, in the example of a marketing contract, well, I'm sure it would govern all the marketing services that that marketing company would provide for the practice in exchange for the fees that are being paid by the practice. Um, with respect to getting out, though, usually there's a termination clause. And a termination clause, the doctor really needs to be aware of 
because that clause governs how to get out of the deal. And usually contracts can be terminated. No, well, number one, I will say that a contract can be terminated. However, the contract says that it will. But usually there are certain phases. There's, there's the doctor can terminate, or a keto party can usually terminate the agreement, like, with cause, meaning, like, somebody breaches the agreement, and therefore the other party gets to terminate the agreement for cause immediately because the other party breached, meaning the other party did not fulfill their promises that they made in the agreement. That would be one example of a termination for cause that oftentimes allows the contract to be terminated immediately. Then there's often termination without cause, and sometimes a contract doesn't have that. Sometimes the contract will only go for the term of the length of the contract, and no party can get out. And the doctor has to be just as aware of that as they are in as if a contract where it does stipulate that the parties can get out. And, you know, on that note, if there is a termination without cause provision, normally there's a notice period. Not always, but normally the contract will say either party can terminate this agreement without cause voluntarily on blank day's notice. And so that's what the doctor needs to focus on is how can I get out of this deal? And there are situations where the doctor is going to want different exit strategies where they want to be able to get out of the deal whenever they want. And there are certain situations where a doctor might not want to let the parties out of the deal because they need the service provider is providing to them so badly that they can't really afford for the other party to get out of the deal. And thus, they'll sort of operate it just on a term. This contract is blank months or years long, and each party has to fulfill their obligations during that period without being able to Terminate. That was sort of a long answer, but I think that's those are the three phases of the in operation through and the out, and really focusing more on the out because I think doctors get nailed all the time and not really strategizing or understanding yes. when and how they can get out of a deal. Yes, and you and I have worked on. So many deals over the years through Productive Dentist Academy and our clients, you've been such an advocate on their behalf. And I love the example that you're using uh, for the marketing group. And so, for example, we have a product called Forever Site. And what we do is we amortize most of the cost of that website build over three years. We found that doctors weren't really excited about paying, you know, eight thousand bucks a year, <laughs> eight thousand bucks to rebuild their website every year and a half. So we just said, what what does it need to maintain your site, keep it fresh for three years? We'll amortize that cost. And if you choose to leave before that, the termination clause is you can leave early, and there's a thousand dollar transfer fee, which goes to recoup all of our hard costs that we may have invested in that site, you know, and all the things that, that we had to do. So I love that as an example of really looking for those terminations. We've had other clients that we bring on at, at, in marketing, let's say, and they're so rigid, you can't get out of them. Or practice management that seems so rigid, the doctor can't get out of it, and they end up paying thousands of dollars a month for something that didn't work. And then they had to go seek another solution. So paying attention to that termination clause is huge. Um, I'm glad that you're broadening this up. When I when I uh, brought you on the interview, I thought we'd stay really close to like partnerships and associates and things like that. But there are, what would you say, two dozen different types of contracts you might enter into with your software, with your uh, advisors with marketing, with associates, with your building lease, with your mortgage, with your lenders. I mean, there's a ton of contracts. Yeah, there absolutely are. And I think that one of, one other fact that I need to comprehend, and this does speak to the transition territory, and maybe that's a good segue, that Oftentimes, when you as a doctor make a business decision to enter into an agreement, you as a doctor also need to factor in that whatever agreement you enter into is an agreement that you may have to pass on if you decide to transition or sell your practice. 
And that can be in the form of you form a partnership and simply all you get the same parties involved except there's, you know, obviously there's a new party involved, but you're still involved as a doctor, but maybe there's a new entity that the, the partnership is going to operate out of and you need to be sort of fluid and flexible to be able to move the contracts to the new partnership so that you as a doctor aren't stuck with 100% of the cost. You should be stuck with whatever cost your partnership is free to govern. Um, and then on a more extreme level, if you are selling 100% of your practice, then certainly you'd want the ability to be able to assign that contract over to the buyer of the practice. And I think that's good for both parties because the marketing company in, in that example still wants the ability to work with the new party that can be involved as well. I think that, that can often be a win. But also, the party that's getting transferred the contract and, you know, obviously needs to want to engage in that agreement as well. So it's important to hand the contracts with great company like great companies, obviously like a PDA like you guys, to where it would be sort of a seamless transition. And the doctor that's buying or transitioning in would obviously really want to take that on and want to make sure that that contract can be transferred. Right. Uh, and I, I see that a lot, too, if you're selling into a DSO framework, they likely want the choice to get out of some of the software contracts that you may have because they have a different platform. So keeping that fluid and flexible, would you say having it fixed or flexible increases or decreases the value and the sellability, or, or does it depend? I think the main thing... The main element that increases sellability and marketability is assignability, where you as a doctor are able to assign the contract to the party that's going to be the successor. And, you know, in the sense of like an associate agreement, the ability to assign that is going to be huge because the buyer in a transition is going to want to know that whatever non-compete clauses you had with your associate, that they can be transferred over to them so that they don't have your associate opening up right next door to them when they move in, right? That decreases marketability if they know the associate can open up right next door to them. Whereas with a, with a marketing company and that type of thing, um, as long as it is a source, like again, like a PA or something like that, it's very credible, then I think that you're in really good position because the buying party is going to want that contract. They're going to want to take advantage of it. Yeah. Maybe you signed up for something and it's a three-year deal or something and, and, the, and the rates have gone up since. So the buying party wants to lock, be able to lock that in and being able to be assigned that agreement is really valuable. Um, so I think assignability is really the key element that keeps the contract or rather the practice um, marketable. So let's go into that. You gave me two examples of where assignability increases the value. One with the associate agreement and the non-competes. Totally agree with that. And probably your building leases, if, especially if you're grandfathered into a sweetheart deal and <laughs> you're, you know, you've got the landlord locked for five years and they can't take advantage of the upswing. So other than those, what else would have great transferable value? So I definitely think, just to kind of recap, associate agreement for sure, marketing or third-party vendor contracts, assuming that they're vendor, vendors that are really sort of reputable and that most buyers would want. Because obviously, if you enter into an agreement as a doctor with a third party that is really specific to you that nobody else would want, then that's going to decrease your marketability, right? So that, that should be taken into account. But then the third one that I've mentioned is, you nailed it, the lease. The lease, it, it, it's huge to be able to assign that lease over to the buyer. I mean, that can often make or break deal. Now, it's probably unrealistic to think that a landlord is going to permit you as a doctor to assign the lease to whoever you want, whenever you want, without their consent. Most leases say that the tenant can assign the lease as long as the landlord consents. But what you want as a dentist in that agreement is that 
the consent of the landlord can't be unreasonably withheld or delayed, meaning they can't be unreasonable or can't just not respond in the event that a contract is going to be transferred. Um, and they have to be fair about it. And that way, the, the landlord can't restrict your marketability of your practice. Because when you, when you hit the, the nail on the head there with the lease and you're talking about marketability versus non-marketability, there's nothing less marketable than the landlord doesn't have to let you assign your lease and they basically are the gatekeeper to whether you get to sell your practice or not. That is definitely not something that you want. And then I, I, you know, take the lease to a further level, not to get like too deeply into the weeds here. Uh, you want to, as a doctor, look out for when you do assign your lease, if you still have to remain a guarantor on the lease when the other party mm-hmm. comes in um, to the lease. And that's something you really want to negotiate as heavily as you can on the front end, because oftentimes doctors get surprised when they're selling that they have to remain a guarantor. And then as an attorney, you look at their lease and the doctor will, hey, doctor, Jones or Johnson or so-and-so, you, by the way, already agreed that we'll stay on as territory. Did you know that? You know, and then they'll usually not know that. So I think that that's obviously a really, a really key item. But as far as what's assignable, I think for doctors, the main ones are the associate agreement, the uh, lease, and um, third-party vendor contract um, with companies such as marketing companies. Those would be the main ones when we talk about contract assignability and a transition. You're you're walking me down a road that we've been down many times. <laughs> um, sure. Right. I remember one of the practices that I bought was in a condo. It was three units. The three doctors each owned their condo, and the practice I bought was right in the center. And the seller didn't really realize until the end. He knew he had to get permission from the other two partners to sell his condo. He didn't realize that he needed to get permission to lease it as he sold his practice. So we really got into that quagmire that you're talking about, and it almost flipped the deal. Um, In some ways, I wish that it had because I came in between two very established doctors. (laughs) Our young doctor walked in and bought 400 patients walk into the doors of the other two. They should have been very happy. I, I, I now know why the other two owners were happy to allow a new doctor to come in. <laughs> that was a tough lesson to learn. Um, you're just giving such gold to what to negotiate up front, right? So you started out with really looking at the offer, the acceptance, the consideration, how do you get in, how do you operate, how do you get out of the deal, and two of the things here, the assignability of the contracts and whether you remain a guarantor after the assignability, that's a very big thing to look at in the how do you get out. And also for termination clauses or the lack of termination clauses, whether it's for cause or not the cause, how do you get out? I, those have been some of the things that I think have been the most costly to me uh, when I hadn't, when I failed to realize, you know, and look at them ahead of time. Is there anything else that you could think of, like mistakes that you make getting into it, and then you go, "Man, I wish I had met you when you signed this. I wouldn't let you sign it." <laughs> what do you, what do you see yeah. mistakes? <laughs> what, what popped into my head immediately, um, because it, this happened last night, um, I have a client that's selling to a, a DSO, and this is a fairly significantly large deal, and then they email me and say, total after the fact, they say, hey, David, by the way, you know, a week before this deal, I bought a new panel machine, and um, I want the... You have to like take that off that contract on now, and I was like, "Well, why would you do that <laughs> a week before you sell and not tell the buyer? Because if the buyer doesn't want it, what are you going to do with it? And you're responsible to make the payment. So, I mean, if you want to talk about another type of contract that you might want to be assignable as possible, but it would be you know any type of maybe like equipment." contract or something like that. But of course I think one of the bigger mistakes that I that I see happen is that doctors don't consult their team and team is really important. And team doesn't just consist of attorneys, team also consists of consultants and accountants and you know other advisors that are part of the team. 
team. And consulting your team before you sign any contract, I think, is a really good principle for doctors to have because sometimes it's not about the contract you're signing and whether it's a good or bad deal or whether it's good or bad for the practice. Sometimes the timing of when you're signing the doctor significantly matters. And so talking to your team can help you save time, money, and headaches. I always say that. That's one that definitely popped out as a mistake off the top of my head. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Investment Grade Practices Podcast. If you find value in this episode, help us spread the word by passing it along to a dental friend, subscribe, and give us a like on iTunes or Spotify. Learn more about building your investment grade practice at ProductiveDentist.com today.